If I hadn't had a chance to meet you, my name's Todd, and me and my wife and our kids and our family get to serve here. And man, we just love what God is doing in this season. Um, if you're a guest with us, we're in the middle of 21 Days with God. You can get all the information at 21dayswithgod.com because we ran out of books. So I, that's how, I, 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 hey man, that's how big uh, what God is doing. We actually printed thousands of books and they're gone. So it's, uh, it's amazing what God is doing. But we, we're on day number eight. If you fell off the wagon, jump back on day number eight. 21 Days with God, there's a PDF version, encourage you. We have uh, prayer nights tomorrow night, 6 p.m. If you missed last week because of the weather, 6 to 7 p.m. tomorrow night, we're going to gather for guided prayer, and we have child care. Love to see you here. Monday during the day, the noonday, the lunch hour, the church is open for you to drop in five minutes, 15 minutes, 30 minutes just to pray and seek the Lord on your own, and we would love to have you do that uh, as part of what we're doing. So if you got your message notes, let's grab them. Let's jump into what God is saying. Man, my whole goal for this series is for uh, you to be able to say that I'm living my life on purpose, that every year after this year, you could say the little tagline at the bottom that you're living for what you were created for. And my only ask throughout the series is that you watch or attend every week. If you missed last week, we're kind of building on that premise, and uh, I don't typically tell you to go back and watch it, but I need you to go back and watch it because we laid the foundation last week that the secret to a life on purpose purpose is to get close to the one who made you. And, and so that's why we're doing 21 Days with God is we're building this thing from the ground up. And the quote that got me during the prep that just made me so much more passionate about this, uh, one of the authors I was reading says this, people don't lead their lives, they accept their lives. And I want us to live our lives on purpose. Come on, say that title with me. One, two, three, on purpose. Let's go to Acts chapter 23 for this part two installment. I want to use two verses to kind of as a diving board, and then we're going to look at some selected verses from the life of the Apostle Paul. When we get to Acts 23, you need to know that Paul has been preaching and teaching for 23 years. So if you're a, a Sunday school person or a Bible person, we're 23 years after the Damascus Road experience that Paul had. Um, he has been arrested for preaching Jesus, uh, crucified and risen from the dead by the Jews. The Jews wanted to silence the message of the gospel, and so they have him arrested, and he's in jail. When we read these two verses, you'll notice uh, we got some red letters uh, of what Jesus says, verse 20, uh, chapter 23, verse 11. The following night, after being arrested, the following night, the Lord stood near Paul and said, this is Jesus, take courage as you have testified about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify in Rome. Verse number 12 says this, the next morning, some Jews formed a conspiracy and bound themselves with an oath not to eat or drink until they killed Paul. So you have the words of Jesus and then the motives of the Jews, and I want to preach to you from this topic this morning, when it's not what you pictured. Like, what do you do when it's not what you pictured? Because I would think if, if I had received a word from the Lord, hey, Paul, just like you testified here in uh, Jerusalem, you got to go to Rome. I'm telling you right now, your boy is going to be packing his luggage. We going to Rome. Jesus has done said it, man. We got to go to Rome. I would be pulling up. Yep, I got to find a little cafe, you know, find out where the good coffee shops are. Oh, no, we don't like the Green Giant. We don't like that kind of coffee, like hometown coffee. I would be going on trip advisors, things to do while in Rome, right? Because Jesus has said that we are going to Rome. Now, you can look at me all weird, but that's how you would be doing it too. You would be packing your clothes. Hey, what's, you'd be checking the weather. Should, we, should I bring my swimsuit? Should I bring my swimsuit to Rome? You know, because we're going to the Roman resort. And then it's one of the all-inclusive resorts over there. God doesn't say we're going to Rome. So it's probably got one of them little drinks with an umbrella in it. It's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome. This is this is it, the greatest city in the world. But what do you do when it's not what you pictured? In fact, I brought a few examples. If that doesn't kind of get your mind jarred, I wanted to show you a couple pictures because it's January. Maybe this is what you pictured in your mind your first 13 days. That's it, baby. I'm going to do this. Hey, man, I'm committed. We the point of no return. Come on. We preached it last week, the point of no return. That's what you pictured, and this is what you experienced. That's it right there. Come on. Somebody say amen right there. Yes, sir. Maybe, may, maybe, maybe you, you planned a trip last year, and you went to a place called Disney, and 
and yeah, you spent $7 million going to Disney. You got a second mortgage going to Disney. Come on, parents. You got Look at them kids. Oh, kissing each other, loving each other. And you thought you were going to have a family vacation. Your kids were going to be appreciative. And your kids don't look like that. Your kids are so my next one. That's your kid. That's your kid. <laughs> I had one picture, Pastor Matt, vetoed. Because we, we, that's right, because it was a little girl telling Mickey she was number one. He said, you can't play that in church. You can't put that in church. I probably shouldn't even tell y'all that. I probably should probably get written up by the board for even telling you that. Uh, may, maybe uh, my, life, my wife likes to play in uh, family pictures, you know. So uh, this is a pastor in Ohio. Uh, he has a big family. He wrote a book on parenting. And he, I, I love listening to him about parenting and centering your life on Jesus. And look at them, and they're laughing. They are having a good time. And that's what you do a family picture. You think your family going to look like him. But we did a family picture years ago. This is what our family picture looked like. That's Graham as a baby crying. Carter won't listen. And some white woman went on Pinterest and got a pallet. I don't know why she did that. Y'all remember the pallet era? We were building furniture out of pallets. That's what I experienced. Go back to the title. Everybody in this room had an I pictured it differently moment. Maybe it was last week you came to the service and you were fired up when you left. You're like, 21 days we got doing this. I am doing this. We fasting. We praying. We seeking the face of the Lord. We go do this. I am fired. And that's what I wanted to motivate you and, and, and get you there. But you started this week and it's like, <laughs> I, I, what do you do when fasting, praying, and seeking God is not what you, <laughs> you, you picture because you, you, th you thought you thought you were going to fast and pray and heaven was going to open up, right? Like, oh, you know, I was going to see God and a dove was going to come down. It's going to be like Forrest Gump in that movie with a feather or something. You're like, it's going to be amazing. It's going to be awesome, man. You, know, you thought you were going to float in here on a cloud. You thought your problems were going to disappear. But what do you do when it's not what you picture? Because ain't, it ain't amazing. You're hungry and you're busy, and you're frustrated, and you might not do the Jack and Coke, but you sure do love Ben and Jerry's. Come on, somebody. <laughs> what do you do when it's not what you picture? Because the problem is when it's not what you picture, it can leave you disappointed. And in my experience, disappointment has killed more purpose than failure ever could. If I could say it again, let me say it one more time. Disappointment has killed more purpose than failure ever could because people get disappointed and disillusioned and they quit and they walk away in the middle. When you had a word from the Lord, you had to be, well, go on. We're, last week's message, the point of no return, I'm committed, but if you are committed, and then all of a sudden, it seems like everything that could go wrong and everything that needed your attention and everything, it, it all kind of came. What do you do when it's not what you picture. I'm gonna give you three things today I think can help you. Number one is this. I think when life is not what, it's, what you picture, you gotta choose to obey along the way. It, it, this is a choice. Your obedience is your choice, and following Jesus, centering your life on Jesus, requires doing the right thing for a long time. I heard people say all the time, I tried that Jesus thing. I'm like, yeah, that's not the way. I don't know if you try it as much as you need to work it for a long time. All right, you know, it, I, I feel the spirit of Rihanna up in here. Work it, work, 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 work. All right, I got that down, right? So you need to do the right thing for a long time. Why? Because obedience is the lifelong calling of a Christ follower. Obedience. I get, hey, y'all look, I, I, I wish y'all could see y'all. Obedience is kind of like giving a kid bad tasting medicine. <laughs> I don't like that. But here's the deal. Here's what you don't understand. Obedience to God's will, obedience to God's word, makes God's involvement in your life not just a theory in your mind, but a reality in your life. In fact, I want you to see, so in, verse, in, in chapter 23, Paul said, hey, Jesus said, you're going to Rome. Look at, look at verse uh, 19 of chapter 26. It's in your notes. We'll throw it on the screen. So then King Agrippa said this. Uh, so then Paul said to King Agrippa, I was not, and we read the underlined words together, I was not, say it with me, disobedient to the vision. I was not disobedient to the vision from heaven, King Agrippa. Look what Paul said. Paul said, I wasn't disobedient to those in Damascus, those in Jerusalem, those in all of Judea, and those in the Gentile. Look what he says. I say it with me. I preach that they should repent, turn to God, and demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. Paul said, I was obedient to the purpose that God had on my life. Why? Because we can never reach our full potential in Christ being disobedient to Christ. 
And that's to say, and, I, and, and when I think about this, I think about my kids because uh, I love my kids. Anybody love your kids? Like, I love them. Like, I would die for them. I want to protect them. But sometimes when they disobey me, y'all, when they disobey, something wells up on the inside of me. And I know some of y'all got that gentle parenting thing down, and you're like, Johnny, what lessons did we learn? We, I didn't grow up with gentle parenting. I grew up with southern parenting. It said something like this. What, not what lesson did we learn? You'll learn. Oh, you'll learn. <laughs> touch that stove. I dare you. Touch it again. I had a parent that would say, I wish he would. Anyway, that's a different style of parenting, right? Come on, somebody, right? Why, why do we get so upset when we tell our kids to do something and they directly disobey? Because when they disobey, it says, I know more than you. When, it says, when they disobey, it says, I don't trust that you are for my good. Can I tell you something? When you disobey God, what you are telling God, what you already know you should do is, God, I know more than you, and I don't trust that you are for my good. We can never reach our full potential living our lives in disobedience. We've got to learn to obey along the way. In fact, let me show you the way. Here's a little outline, not in your notes. We'll throw it on the screens of Acts chapter 24 through Acts chapter 28. Acts chapter 23, we get the vision from heaven. Paul says, Jesus came down and told him, you're going to Rome. Pack your bags, we're going to Rome. Acts 23. Acts 24 through 26, Paul's in prison in a place called Caesarea for two years. Two years. Not, not two days. Not two weeks. Not two months. You think, you think the U.S. judicial system is slow? Two years. He got a word from the Lord, and then two years, he has to stay in prison. But all along the way, he's obedient. He has to stand before this guy named Felix. The Bible says in Acts chapter 24, Felix was, he, he would talk to Paul in hopes that Paul would bribe him. That's what he wanted. He, he was a corrupt politician that wanted a bribe. He was greedy. And Paul would tell him to repent. Paul would tell him to trust God. Paul would tell him who Jesus was. And then Felix gets moved out, and there's another governor comes in. His name is Festus. If you're looking for a baby name, Festus, all right? Festus is up for grab. Come on, gun smoke, somebody. Come on, I'm old enough. I'm old enough for some gun smoke, Festus. I know what it is. And Festus come, comes along, and he, he's a member of the swamp, like the D.C. swamp. So he tries to work the political system. He's like, oh, man, I'm going to move him from Caesarea to Jerusalem to appease the Jews, so I'll make this political apparatus happy with me so that they will keep me in office. And Paul tells, tells Festus about Jesus, and Paul tells Festus that he needs to repent and turn to God. And if you keep reading in chapter 26, there's these two people come in named King Agrippa and Bernice. The Bible says they come in with royal pomp and circumstance. I started doing some research. These people sound important. Who is King Agrippa and Bernice? Because you read about it like it's King and queen, husband and wife. Nope, it's brother and sister. I, I, I did a study. I was like, what in the Mississippi is going on here? All right. <laughs> Country roads, take me home <laughs> to the place where I belong. Mississippi, right? That's right. <laughs> what do you call 32 Mississippians in a room? A full set of teeth. Anyway, sorry, focus people, focus people. I'm joking, people. Simmer down. It's a joke. If we didn't have Mississippi, Alabama had nobody to make fun of. Anyway, so, so then you got these, sex, so Paul's got to tell these sexually immoral, these corrupt politicians, these greedy people, and Paul is faithful to preach the gospel. He obeyed. He didn't say, nah, I'm done. I'll say whatever. No, he said, I'm faithful along the way. And finally, at the end of chapter 26, at the beginning of 27, Paul set sails for Rome. Come on, say finally. One, two, three. Finally. Paul, two years and some odd days later, finally, he set sails for Rome. But it's not on a carnival cruise ship. It's on a prison ship. So he's on a prison ship. And they go out, and they don't have Weather Channel or Jim Cantore. I'm, why are you telling me this? Read chapter 27. They run into a hurricane. What is wrong with these people? And the Bible says that the ship is tossed to and fro, and they have seen no sun, moon, or stars for 14 days. The, storm, the ship is battered. The food is gone, and they're about to die. Welcome to the Apostle Paul's calling. And he, uh, he enters the storm and the hurricane, and uh, Paul says, 
I could only imagine Paul saying, this is, when, when Jesus said we're going to Rome, I was thinking this is not what I pictured. We get to chapter 28, the storm runs to ground on the rocks, and he sh- we got shipwrecked, snake bites, and then Rome, because we got a little bit more to go. So they shipwrecked on this little island called Malta, and, t- and, and Paul looks like that Tom, Tom Cruise on that movie, Castaway, and they build a fire, and Paul's like, I told y'all God was going to save because if you, some of y'all are like, you're just a faith preacher. You wouldn't like Paul. I was like, I told you he's going to save us. I told you take courage. God had us, and he gets on there, and he builds a fire, and they're like, man, this is awesome, and then they build a fire, and the Bible says that a snake comes out, and it bites Paul, and then he has to go Taylor Swift on them, shake, shake, shake it off. So he shakes, shakes off the fire because they, because the people on Malta are like, ooh, he escaped the goddess justice in the sea, but he will die here. He shakes it off with no effect. You're a murderer. And then they're like, no, he's a god. And he spends three months ministering there. And finally, he goes to Rome. And when I was reading all of these things, I began to look. I bet Paul was thinking, this is not what I pictured, but here's the deal. If we can't obey God where we are, why would we ever get to where God wants us to be. Paul did not know all the details in Acts chapter 23, but he had decided disobedience is not an option. This is all through the New Testament. The apostle Peter, Acts chapter 5 verse 29, said it this way. Peter and the other apostles replied, we must say it with me, obey God. The decision has been made. Obedience is a demonstration of trust. Now listen, you are not saved by your obedience, but your Obedience is a demonstration that something spiritual has taken place. Your obedience is, man, you had an I was, but now moment. Like, I was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. Come on, does anybody know that you've had a meeting with the man from Galilee? Can you say amen? Amen. Obey along the way. Number two, number two, jot it down, number two. Understand every piece has a purpose. Our lives are made up of small individual pieces. So to live a life on purpose, if there was a secret this week, I would say you need to learn to do daily well. Because your life is made up by the sum of your daily decisions. So here's what I'm learning to say. Is there is purpose present in every moment. Purpose is present in every moment. So Paul goes to Rome. Let's go to Rome. Fast forward to Rome. Show my scripture. Book of Philippians chapter 1. Paul's in Rome. Now, I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what has, say it with me, happened to me. Come on, say it together. Happened to me. What's happened to him? Shipwreck, snake bites, false trials, two years imprisonments, beating. He says, I want you to know that all of that has actually, hold up a second, because I would be like, all that didn't need to happen, Lord, <laughs> has actually served to advance the gospel. Paul said, everything that happened led me here. Everything that happened served a purpose. Everything that happened had purpose attached to it. See, living your life on purpose is not about leaving this place and changing your job and changing your career. It's about saying, no, there is purpose here. There is purpose present in every moment. So I'm going to live my life on purpose right here. It's not about divorcing your spouse and leaving your kids. It's about saying, no, I'm a man of purpose right here. There is purpose in this marriage. There is purpose purpose in this family. I'm going to live life on purpose. There's purpose here. If I could say it the way scripture would say it, Paul would say that there's purpose in the prison. Daniel would say that there's purpose in the lion's den. Moses would say that there was purpose in the Red Sea. David would say that there's purpose in the shepherd's field. Can I tell you that every piece of your life has purpose? If you believe it, say amen. Amen. So, so I was thinking about how we could illustrate this, and I don't know, it, I'm, I'm a, I'm my kids, uh, anybody ever get into Legos? Your kids ever get into Legos? And yeah, uh, Can you bring my box out here, Pastor Matt? I asked Pastor Matt to get me a box and, uh, of Legos, and, and, and because uh, we got into it from, for, for just a little bit, um, because me and my kids, we, <laughs> uh, we went to Legoland. That's uh, uh, down in uh, Winter Haven, Florida. That's the poor man's Disneyland. Anyway, uh, so we went down there, and uh, I, I, I've always hated meticulous little things like this, and, um, and, and it, it's, it's because it's just, you, if you lose, you lose them, they get all over the place, and man, if you ever step on one of these in the middle of the night, you, you make a Calvinist lose his salvation right there. Anyway, sorry, that's a theological good, you'll get that later. All right, so I told Pastor Matt, get me one. This thing right here was $150. I used to play with Lincoln Logs. Come on, somebody, right? 
25 cent. That's right. That's right. We played with a link. We built real stuff. Anyway, all right. so, so I was thinking, I, I told Pastor Matt, um, get me this. So we went to Legoland one year, and we'd never really been to Legoland, but Legoland's it's cool, man. It is cool. And they have the Lego store there, so we went in. There's these huge ones like Eiffel Tower, White House, and all these cool things, man. And I, I was, I'm was, like, we, we, we ain't getting one of those, so we got something, something like this. And I began to, uh, we went back to the room, and uh, I thought, let me move over here. I thought I was getting a ship. And I looked inside. <laughs> In case y'all can't see. Are you stinking kidding me? I bought that, not, not this. Some of y'all, I'm about to preach this, by the way. So I thought that we were buying a ship, and then. I, I bought that, and Lego gives me this. Every piece has a purpose. Every piece. Because I've seen so many Christians say, say, got a word for the Lord, going to Rome. You're called, chosen. You're going to be a minister, a missionary. You're going to build a business. And like, man, I heard from the Lord. I'm doing this right here. I'm called to do this. And, and, and you show up to God, and God's like, all right, here you go. Because purpose shows up to your life in pieces. Purpose shows up to your life. I remember when I was a, I was, I was a young man. I was a young youth pastor. I told, I told my senior pastor, I said, I'm called to preach. He said, you are. I said, yes, I've been called to preach. I'm anointed, uh, not disjointed. I'm the Holy Ghost filled, fire baptized. I got it all. I, you know, I, I, I can speak in tongues and divide doctrine. I can do it all. I'm, I'm, re I'm ready to do that. He goes, you ready to preach? I said, yeah. He handed me this right here and said, hey, we got a student closet that needs to be cleaned out. Will you go clean that out? I said, no, sir. I don't think you heard me. I'm ready to preach. He said, if you can't clean, you can't preach because purpose shows up to your life in pieces I, I see people all the time like no I didn't, I didn't want that I didn't want that the problem is if you get something like this in one season you'll look at it and say I don't need that but you have no idea if what you threw away in one season is what God is going to count on in the next season to build what you what he needs in your life purpose shows up to your life in pieces and you're walking away from your purpose because you're walking away from pieces because it's not what is pictured and pictured is I'm supposed to be I'm supposed to be a business owner I'm supposed to be an entrepreneur I wasn't supposed to go bankrupt it's a piece I wasn't supposed to be I had a, I had a picture of a marriage I wasn't supposed to be divorced I don't like this piece I don't like this piece. But if you want to build the life that God has for you, it's going to take peace after peace after peace. This is what I want, and this is what God gives me. But if you, if you wait long enough, uh, Clay Long, are you back there? Clay Long, are you back there? Y'all give it up for Matthew Clay. Come on, right there. Let me, let me get you up in front of all of these people. I'm going to move this back here. Now, me and Carter and Graham are not Lego people, but Matthew Clay and Matthew Long, Pastor Matt, are Lego people. So can uh, you get the microphone? How many pieces is in this? 1,260. 1,260 pieces. Purpose comes in pieces. How, how long did it take you and your dad to do that? Four hours. 
Who, who did the most work, you or your dad? My dad. <laughs> He's testing him, testing his integrity. Watch your, hey, how many steps were there? 350. I'm borrow this for this service real quick. I'm gonna give it right back to you. I don't wanna drop it, we got one more service. <laughs> did y'all use Lego glue? Did y'all use, no, oh, Lord. If you don't choose to obey along the way and understand that every piece has a purpose, you can never achieve the dream that God placed in your heart. Come on, y'all give it up for them real quick. Why why would God give you an income of a million dollars if you won't be faithful with a thousand? I was quiet in this Presbyterian church. Y'all were shouting me down, you clapping. Matthew Clay's cute. It's just a piece. Just a piece. Well, why would give you, why would God give you the desire in your heart if you won't obey what's in his word? Because what'll happen is you'll get something you don't like, even a hurtful piece, a painful piece, and you'll throw it away. <laughs> but you didn't realize God was gonna use it to build on. Every purpose has a peace, and what I've learned with God is that nothing is wasted. There's not a season of your life that's wasted. There's not a setback that's wasted. There's not a pain that's wasted. Every piece, he's piecing something together. There's purpose in every piece. So number three, and we're done. I think Paul would tell you, never underestimate trusting in God. Write it down, close your books. Why? Because places of trust are places of growth. Trust is not intellectual, I trust you. It's a decision, it produces something. Look at the verse, look at the verse, look at the verse. Throw it up there for me. This is the Apostle Paul again. May the God of hope fill you with all, say it with me, joy and what? As you what? Worry can't produce joy and peace in you. Anxiety can't do it. It's only by trusting in God. You bow your heads. Will you close your eyes if you're in this room? And the journey's been longer than you thought. And the circumstances and situation of your life has tried to talk you into giving up and quit trusting and quit hoping. If the pieces of your life is shattered... And man, you feel that tension. You, you feel like giving up. The enemies whisper to you in the midnight hours, give up hope. Give up peace. Look at the circumstances. Look at what's going on. If that's you, if you have been tempted to give up trust, I want to pray for you on count of three. I just want you to shoot your hand in the air. One, two, three. Get them up. Get them up. Tempted. Come on, stand with me all over this room. If you raised your hand, I'm going to ask you to make a bold step, and we only have about five minutes to make this happen. I need you to come forward right now. If your life right now is not what you pictured, and the enemy of your soul is whispering to you, quit, give up, you made a mistake, you can't put it back. I, I got a God that can piece it back together. He can put it back together.